everybody, it's Tony Vaughn here on Outside the Box on Expansion Network. My guest today is Maureen St. Germain. She has over 25 years experience in the area of mystical and sacred traditions. She's known as the practical mystic. Um, she is an author and she has accomplishments a list a mile long that, <laughs> that there's no way we could possibly cover um, in this entire episode, but I'm so excited to talk with her and I think you're gonna love this. Okay, here she is, Maureen St. Germain, with her fabulous Christmas earrings to go with our Christmas spirit. Thank you so much. Merry Christmas, for everyone. being here. Yes, oh, Merry Christmas, I'm, everybody. <laughs> I'm not going to leave these on. Uh, actually, I'm going to turn the lights off, but you'll okay. remember me because I did this goofy thing, and yes. that's important. So we love thank goofy. you for having me, Tony. It's a riot. Yes, we're, we're, she like, saw Tony, my background and decided yeah. to put those on for you, so... <laughs> Yeah. Okay. Um, so you have such an extensive, um, going back more than two decades now of experience in, um, in the spiritual realm and in this industry and stuff like that. I mean, more than we could even possibly cover um, on the show today. But some of the things that I wanted to touch on, uh, my favorite first question always is to ask when you when this became a part of you most people it's when they're very young they just they kind of know right away so I but I would love to hear how this all began for you well I um I think I was born awake um I knew at a very young age that there were beings watching me um both benevolent and otherwise um and did I that freak you out at all? I wasn't worried about it. I, I, um, I always knew I was safe. I was okay. As a matter of fact, it's just kind of a cute story. I always knew how safe I was that um, when in kindergarten, and the kindergarten teacher asked me what my phone number was, and I didn't know it. And then she asked me what my address was, and I didn't know it. I said to her, why are you asking me these questions? when you obviously have the answer on the paper in front of you now what kindergartner knows that the teacher's got the answer in front of her yeah okay yeah and me it's funny <laughs> it's funny yeah because i was annoyed that she was bothering me with these stupid questions yeah isn't that funny there's bigger but, things going on lady like <laughs> stop asking me stupid questions yeah exactly Did you and, and of course that's how safe i felt then yeah. I knew I was well taken care of. I knew somebody would come for me and it didn't matter if they knew where I was or not, you know? Yeah. So, and, um, and did you have, um, family members? Was this kind of a, a, a passed on thing so that you did have people that you could talk to? Well, <clears throat> my mother, um, my mother was very gifted and I think my father was too. My father was very intuitive. He didn't say much, but they both went to, um, um, a well-known uh, psychic. Now, what was it called? I can't remember, but um, a well-known name of a, a teacher who taught these skills. And in the course, my father um, had the experience of being able to see into a person's body and he saw the woman had cancer. And he did not want to be the one to tell her. Yeah. So he kind of pushed it away a little bit. But he did have a healthy respect for this ability. And my mother often said things that there's no way she would have known except for, you know, she was feeling it. She was hearing it. Yeah. Um, and she also told some stories from her own youth that proved to us that she knew stuff. So... Um, it wasn't frowned on or thought of as weird. It was more like tolerated. And, you know, my mother had kind of put a boundary around what she was doing. And she was mostly working with her Catholic faith. Um, but she didn't, she didn't uh, ever send me any kind of a message of disapproval or anything like that. Yeah. Did you have siblings? Um, I do. I'm one of six. Oh, wow. And are any of the other five? Um, my, with this ability? my um, I have one sister who passed away, and the two brothers um, experienced the car accident with her oh. that she um, passed away from, uh, which was very freaky for both of them. And then um, my sister is very uh, 
um, supportive in a very um, loving way. And she has her own uh, experience of spirituality, but you know, I'm, I'm, you know, miles into the rabbit hole. She's probably a mile down, <laughs> or two miles down. you know, I'm like, I'm on the other side of the with my rabbit hole and the guys, yeah. you know, both my brothers, um, I think they get a lot of information and they just keep their mouth shut. So they're kind of like your dad then that way. Yeah. 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 Um, well, that's good that you've got. Oh, support. I know. It was Jose Silva they took their class from. It was who? Jose Silva. Oh, okay. I don't have it anymore, but I had an autographed copy of his book, you know, yeah. way back when. And um, so I had some support. It wasn't completely weird. Um, when I got married, my husband thought it was pretty weird, but then he also followed me down the rabbit hole. Initially, I think he followed me down the rabbit hole so I wouldn't, get, wouldn't he wouldn't lose me. And then yeah. he, then he got, you know, got turned on. And I used to call him the reluctant mystic. Um, <laughs> and, um, you know, after 25 years, uh, we split up, but he continues to have, I'll call it a fringe experience yeah. that um, we kind of compare notes once in a while, you know, make jokes about it. Um, so that's, you know, that's okay. And, um, you know, I had the sense to not talk about it or to talk about it, you know. I knew when to and when not to. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. I, I imagine it would be easier to read people and see, you know, who would be okay to talk to about it and who you need to just kind of exactly. keep it. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. And so at, at what point did it become... I mean, over 25 years, I know that I've, I've seen other interviews and I know that you, um, you did the, the normal thing and for a while and raised kids and were in the workforce and stuff like that. But then at, at some point, this became my life everything. Work. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I, I worked in the corporate world about 20 years. Uh, I raised a family. I have four sons. Um, I, um, my youngest was 10 when my marriage ended. And then I continued to raise them until they were finished with college. Um, so I, you know, I had a big system and I had, you know, a lot of incentive, but I was already knee deep into it. I was doing study groups and things like that, but I, I, I stayed in the closet, so to speak. Yeah. <laughs> and then um, then uh, I changed jobs. And when I changed jobs, I told them that I had a little business and I was doing this kind of work and they didn't, they didn't have any opinion about it one way or the other. So I was at least exposing that I was out there. Yeah. And, um, so that worked out. Okay. And then, um, after about a year, well, the job I had when I first started, I had a huge vacation schedule. So I was able to just, I had like three weeks of vacation right off the bat. And so I was able to schedule all my events Oh, okay. um, in fact, even, even when I started, I said to the woman I was working for, I've got this event that I've scheduled myself to be at. It means that I can start for you right away, but it means, you know, in, in, in a month's time, I'm going to need to go away and, you know, spend a, a Friday and a Monday away. Is that going to be okay? And it was fine, you know? Yeah. Um, so that was cool. And then I used every single one of my three weeks of vacation to travel to another city to lead workshops. Yeah. And so um, I left that job. And then when I got a new job, I told them I was doing the seminars. And um, I was at the place where I was doing two seminars a month, every weekend that my sons were with their dad. And then um, near the end of that cycle, my uh, son who had gone off to college and come back said, I'm going to live at the house for a year so that you can continue to do the seminars and you can grow that if you want. So he was the parental unit, as he called himself, <laughs> and, um, when I was away for the weekend. And um, who knows? Maybe they said, get mom to go. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's party time. <laughs> <laughs> who knows? And um, so uh, I was very fortunate in that regard. And um, then on my last job, when I uh, explained to them, you know, what I was doing, they, they were fine with it. But then, then they weren't, you know, it was kind of like, 
I think there was in the back of their mind they thought, well, now that you're doing this, you won't need to do that. You know. Yeah, kind of like you were already you were working on getting away from them. Like you were no, working towards I wasn't. something I was else. Not. I was. That's what they thought. No yeah. desire to do this work full time. No <laughs> desire because I had a big system. You know, you, you know when you have kids in college, you're you're chunking out. You know, I was chunking out 20k a year just for yeah. college. You know, you need to be making money to do that. You can't yeah. do it on, on the money people are making in, in this business until you make it really, really big. You right. know, if you make it really big, like Deepak Chopra or something, then fine. But um, anyway, yeah. so I stayed with it. But then there was this, I'll call it the showdown at OK Corral. And my boss, you know, said, no, you can't have that day off. So I came in at 4 a.m. Because the law <laughs> says... If you if you work four hours in a day as a as a, um, a um, management team, you are you've at least completed your obligation. You've shown up. Okay. Yeah. And so I came in at four a.m. and can you believe it? He was already there. Oh wow! <laughs> and he was thrilled that I was there at four a.m. until I left at nine. <laughs> <laughs> I got fired the following week. Anyway, um, um, I got a check. We parted on very good terms. We laughed. Um, I got a wonderful letter of recommendation that I never needed. But um, I had gone to the altar when we had this little showdown. And actually, it wasn't the next week. It was like a month later. And, and, and I recognized that he was unhappy. Um, and I loved my job. And the people I worked with loved me. But I also loved my seminar business. So there was yeah. no contest between the two. You know, one paid very well and one didn't. Um, but I started looking at how much money I was making and I was doing okay. I didn't bother looking at my expenses. If I had, I would have seen that I was just breaking even. But yeah. it looked like a lot of money, you know? So, um, but I wasn't counting my airfare and all that other expense. So anyway, after we had this little sh conversation and, and he expressed his unhappiness, I, um, I, um, I said at the altar, okay, I'm ready. If I'm supposed to do this work full time, then uh, I will, um, uh, I'm ready to let go. And then once I did that, then I had everything come together. Uh, and that's when I got the check and the invitation to leave and like that. And like I said, yeah. it, was, it was a funny conversation, you know, I, uh, my my boss said it's not working, and I said, well, "When do you want me to leave? When such and such is done, or did you want? Were you thinking more like today?" And he says, "No, I was thinking about today." I mean, it was hilarious. <laughs> like, just you get know. out. <laughs> no, it was no anger. You see, that's the thing. Yeah, was, I, he loved <clears throat> me. Everyone loved me, and so it was. To, you know, he was. He, everything was so nuts at that place at that time that the head of personnel department walked out and said, "I am not firing her. You go do the dirty work." And then his secretary, then the secretary to the CEO um, said, I'm not going to be here when you let her go. That, that's the goofiest thing I've ever heard. You can't let her go. And I'm leaving. And so she wouldn't support him either. So, he, you know, he had to go do it by himself, which is really funny because he had it in his mind that he had to let me go. And the funniest thing is then that following Monday when the other guy who was my counterpoint, there were two of us who worked in uh, a field where we were both acting as lobbyists and also liaisons as a professional trade association. He said, where's Maureen? And, you know, the CEO said, well, I let her go on Friday. And he said, you let her go? And, he, and the CEO said, yes. And what he didn't know is that that guy had gotten an offer on Friday and couldn't make up his mind whether he should take the new job or stay where he was at. <sighs> Wow. So as, soon as, as soon as he heard that I, he said, I'm, I'm leaving. And he walked out. That, that's it. You know, you're firing her. I'm next. And he walked out and took the other job. Yeah. Wow. And of course, then the CEO got in trouble with the board. How could you let these two fine people go? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. One was bad enough. And now we just lost them both. So was it after this? I know that you have gone and, and done workshops and taught all over the world. Um, yeah, well, it was. Kind of, I, kind of already, it up. Yeah, I, I was already pretty well established in in my workshop business, and I was teaching the Merkaba, the Seventeen Breath Merkaba. And so, what I did is then I put pedal to the metal, and I scheduled myself every single weekend. 
And this was crazy because I was in a different city every single weekend. I added workshops. So I taught manifestation workshops and I taught um, a follow-up workshop to the Merkaba to help people take it to the next level. And um, so I was already growing the business, you know. And what I did is I took up everyone who said they wanted to host me. I'm now saying, okay, I'm ready. When do you want to do this? And I literally had everything filled in my schedule that you could think of. And so um, <clears throat> it was almost as if I had to have that many bookings in order to feel safe. And I think that yeah. that was true because I'd had this big corporate job. Now, the interesting thing is um, all this happened right around the time that my, um, my um, son, who was at the most expensive college, he was at an Ivy League school, uh, graduated. So that big check that I had to write was um, over. You know, I was done yeah. with that. And so, you know, that was okay. And then um, um, I had basically to mortgage my home and um, take on debt. And, you know, I did that for a couple of years and then decided I needed to move to New York City and I felt that I would do better there. Um, and I moved to New York City and... And where were you really at before New York? Really, really struggled to make ends meet. Um, New took York's quite a expensive. Few years. Oh my gosh. But, but I was in an environment that was good for me to bring in the business. So it, yeah. it, you know, there was a balance. Um, and, um, after about five years, I started being a little more in the positive. So, you know, I lived like a pauper and lived in a tiny studio apartment and, <laughs> you know, little by little things improved. So yeah. at the end of five years, I think I had two apartments in the same building and, um, you know, a, an assistant full time. So, you know, I was working pretty well. And by this time and the kids are raised. Yeah, you're you're single. I mean, you've got total complete freedom to do to do whatever you want to do. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's amazing. And, um, by that time, my reputation had grown, and and I was doing my own manifestation work. So I was getting offers from all over the world. I never solicited anybody. Can I come work with you? Yeah, that's got to be an amazing people. feeling. Now, um, I will say that I have manifested. Um, these, you know, I, I wanted to, I was teaching in Taiwan and I wanted to teach in Hong Kong and I just put it out there that I was ready and willing to, to teach in Hong Kong. And then an yeah. offer came in. Um, of course it did. <laughs> so, and I, I read in, um, or saw in one of your interviews where you talked about uh, a couple of different interviews where you talked about the way that you came to get the knowledge of the Akashic records. Um, oh. And well, I'm familiar with the Akashic Records, and I mean, I know what they are, um, and I understand that not everybody, in fact, very few people have access to those records, and so that must have been really something, although you said you had wanted it, so you manifested that as well. Well, I did take a class. Um, I took a bunch of classes, actually, and um, I was in another group, and um, it was something that happened that was very challenging for me. Uh, and I was so shocked and I had been told by guidance that I needed to start my own organization. And I was basically, you know, like, no, I don't think so. Kind of energy, you know, I'm not doing that. Don't make me do that. Yeah. And, um, and that's happened to me a number of times where I've been told to do something and I'll just say, no, I don't think so. And then <laughs> I get asked again, you know, and, um, I like to joke around that, um, I take groups all over the world. I take groups to Egypt. I have a group going to Egypt this April. So if any of you listeners want to go to Egypt with me. Um, and the very first time I went was 2002. And I, um, I've taken groups practically every year since. And um, so on this, this very first journey, I... Um, I would go into meditation and prepare for each temple. And then we would do ceremony in each temple. And that's all done very carefully because, you know, technically that's all illegal. They don't allow ceremony and they don't even allow people like me to lecture in the temple. We have to do our lecturing outside of the temple and let the 
guide do all the talking. So I was told to connect one island with another. And um, I said, uh, that was nine years ago that they built the Aswan Dam and the old Philae was flooded. And I don't know if you know this, but the uh, temple that's on the island of Philae, which is called Temple of Isis, was on a different location. And UNESCO saved it by raising funds to have that entire um, temple reconstructed on another island. I did not and they know moved everything brick by brick. And when you look at it and you realize that they moved every single thing brick by brick and reconstructed wow. it, it's remarkable. So mm -hmm. anyway, I'm being told, you know, to bridge the energy with my group. So my first reaction was, that was nine years ago. You know, that they're, they built the dam nine years ago. That's surely somebody's done that already. <laughs> and I was told again, you have to do this. And I said, yeah, but who am I? And then the, the voice in my head said, so you refuse? No, nope, I'm on it. Oh, <laughs> yeah, no, no, I got it. <laughs> yeah. So I, I am a little bit of a reluctant mystic myself in that I really want, um, I want to respect authority. I want to respect the rules. And at the same time, I want to follow guidance. And so mm -hmm. sometimes there's a little bit of a conflict. And at the end of the day, I'm going to respect guidance and follow what guidance tells me. Yeah. I had uh, one of the, my very first guest on the show, who was a medium, was saying that, that working for spirit, she said, it's like being um, pulled in by the mafia. Like you can ignore them for so long, but if they want you in, like you're getting in. Kind of thing. <laughs> <laughs> so like they'll, they'll give you whispers. Yeah, those metaphors are so fabulous. Yeah. Yeah. They'll give you whispers at first, but after a while, the, you know, they start screaming in your ear, like, you know, to where you can't ignore it any longer um, kind of thing. And so, um, so with the Akashic Records, when you do readings, how, what kind of information are you able to extract for like, for the person that you're giving the reading to? And it's not, I'm sure it's not like, I don't believe in, in like, psychic readings because I know that if a psychic picked up on something for me in the future that's based on where I'm at right now and if I change that you know if I'm if I'm vibrating at a different frequency then that outcome is different so so how does that work with the Akashic Records? Well I think that's a really nice thing to start out with because the Akashic Records are for soul growth and they are not a psychic reading and they're not okay. meant to be predicting or future telling. Um, and an easy way to talk about the Akashic Records is to say it's the open book text. So, you know, if you're in chemistry or some, you know, high math, something or other, and they tell you, you can bring your book in to take the test, you do. And you, you know, you use the reference book. And yeah. in a way, life is a test, but not really, but you know, the experiences of life. But if you could go into life with an open book test, you know, open book answer book, yeah. And that would be like being in the records. Now, it's interesting that you mentioned that the um, Akashic Records are not um, available to everybody. This was true, but it is not true anymore. And anyone can get in the records. Anyone can learn to open the records. Um, all they need really is the desire to be in the records. And the, um, <clears throat> the thing that happens is the the tool and the matrix that i hold makes it easy for them to access the data now what kind of data do they get this is one of the things you ask well first of all it's anything that is in your past anything that's in your present and possible or probable futures so there is some future information there but it generally is um tangent to something else that's being talked about um so it isn't like you'd say well what's in my future it's not like you'd say, will I marry this guy? Um, you might be able to ask, do I have a soul contract with them? Um, but generally there's not a lot of stuff. Now in my case, um, I asked that the record keepers um, put a veil over my eyes with regard to any information that would be, for lack of a better term, for entertainment purposes. So if somebody says, well, who was I in a past life? If they, don't, if they don't offer some kind of need to know, that information just doesn't come. And the record keepers often say something along the lines of, well, 
can you reword your question in a way that gives you some kind of benefit other than just curiosity being satisfied? And then they might say, well, I have a big, strong connection to the Native American people, and I wonder if I was an Indian, you see, like that. Okay. And then, yeah, then just, my, yeah. my blinders come off. But if they're just, you know, and another thing that people do on a rare occasion, not very often in the records, but occasionally they'll be told, you know, well, you were a Pleiadian or you were this or you were that. And um, they ask in the records to see if you're going to give them the same information. And that's, that's goofy. That's ego based. Yeah. Now, if they say to me or to the record keepers, you know, in this conversation, I've been told I was a Pleiadian. Can the record keepers confirm that? That is about validating who you are. The other way is about testing the guide. You see, testing right. the person who's the channel. And that just doesn't work for me. And I made a real clear boundary about that. And that's my contract with the record keepers. Now, what kind of information can come through? All kinds of wacky information can come through. All kinds of um, amazing information can come through. Um, um, you know, I had a client a couple of weeks ago who um, asked about a relationship. Um, and she said, I just can't figure this out. I was even married to this woman for a while. And uh, that's all she said. And the record keeper said, she's a rogue. And then they showed me the court jester. And I said, you know, they're showing me an image of a court jester. And then they proceeded to say what the court jester did. The court jester um, was the emotional relief valve for the court. And, you know, spilled the beans on the gossip. Um, informed the king of things that he needed to know without getting a reprisal, was able to speak the truth to the king. Um, you know, I'm just going to make a joke, you know, that crown looks stupid on you. I'm, I don't know, you know, something <laughs> that would be, you know, totally offensive, you could never say, but the court jester was allowed to say anything. Plus he was an informant for the king because he would get the gossip uh, because he was in the court and then he would find a way to release it in a humorous way that everyone would laugh, but now everybody knows. I didn't know that about a court jester. I thought he was just there to make fun. And then when I was, when I was with one of my classes, I was teaching them at level two, and I shared that story with them. One of the people in the class said, oh yeah, the court jester's job was to, you know, like, uh, help the king know what was really going on. Amazing. Oh. Yeah, um, yeah, and another instance, it was really wacky. Um, my, um, my husband asked me about an incident that he was investigating and he's a fire investigator and he'd been on this case for a while and, um, asked me, well, actually I'd seen something that was a little bit scary and I told him about it and he said, well, will you open my records tomorrow? And I said, sure. And when I opened his records, I thought he was going to ask me, you know, like poignant questions like, you know, what do I need to know at this time? And, you know, some, some, you know, like life big questions. And instead he said, what caused the fire? <laughs> and out of my mouth came the answer. And it came out so fast that I didn't filter it. Um, not that you would in the records, but the information that I got was so outrageous that, um, I think I would have filtered it if it had come in any other way. Yeah. And the answer was, uh, it was to cover up a murder, actually cover up two murders. Uh, one was a decoy and one was a fire to uh, get rid of a body. And oh. then I was so shocked. Um, I didn't know anything about this case he was working on and I pulled back, I pulled out all the records and I said, um, I'm really sorry. I don't know where that came from. And then I said, nobody died, did they? Oh. And he said, actually three people died. Wow, and, yeah. Oh. And then through the records, they gave this full story and they told us that it was a mafia job, like a merchant marine mafia. And there's more to that story, but I'll just let people look that up in one of my books. Um, other kinds of information you get in the records is um, information that could be predictive. For example, there's an old story that I've told a lot about a client who was asking about a future roommate. And she was renting a room that had a nice kitchen and dining room, but she had an extra bedroom that she wanted to rent out to help cover. 
and she wanted to know about this new gay guy that was going to move in. And the record keeper said, it'll be fine until the luster wears off. <laughs> she said, luster? What luster? Does that mean he's not going to stay? And they said, that is correct. And she said, well, when is he going to leave? And they named the month following the month we were in. Oh. So she said, she, so she said, well, what, of what year? <laughs> this one. <laughs> this year, you know, it's going to leave in two, in two months. So um, normally they don't give out predictive information. So then she said, well, then maybe I shouldn't rent to him. And they said, no, keep your appointment with him because it will lead you to the roommate of your dreams. Oh. And so she rented to him and the, everything blew up. The guy got involved in drugs and got fired from his job and everything went nuts. He'd come from the West Coast, you know, to reestablish himself on the East Coast. Anyway, the woman that ended up renting from her turned out to be a very close friend. They had, they liked each other so much they had movie night once a week. And that woman wasn't even looking when she first advertised. So, and the other part that I think is so amazing is if you know that, you know, the thing is going to hit the fan and, and you might have to tough it out. You're not going to get so freaked out because you were forewarned. Right. Right. You don't have to, yeah. you don't have to give up all your energy and get all bent out of shape because you also know if that part's true, the other part's true as well. Yeah. And that is the roommate of my dreams is on her way. Yeah. My husband uses uh, football analogies a lot and he would say, because he'll, he'll record the games that are on um, for his team, and then he'll go back and watch it, which I don't understand. <laughs> like, I love watching football, but just once, you know, <laughs> like, I don't want to watch it again. Yeah. But he'll go back and watch it again, but then he can sit there and relax, because when they're down by 10 points or whatever, he's not stressed out anymore, because he knows that the ending <laughs> is going, to, you know what I mean? Like, That's even a watching a movie. Analogy. Yeah. And oh, my gosh, there's so many great ones for football. So many great ones for football, yeah, but movies awesome. too. You know, when you watch a movie that you've seen before and, and everything's crazy in the middle and you're like, but it's, it's going to be okay though. I know because I've seen this already. And you know, if, yeah, if we, if life was like that, if we walked around with a constant knowing that no matter what happens, we're going to be okay, we wouldn't get so stressed out about things and traumatic and, and stuff like that. Um, I did want to ask you though, I know there's a lot of people and, and you may be one that that signed contracts before you came here to do this kind of work and is that and not everybody knows that right away they kind of find out later um is that something that you find out in the akashic records if you if you chose to do something before you came here but but you're not aware of that yet yes that would be something you might be informed about um and and you can also change your contracts so um that's another thing. The work we do in the records at the moment we're in the records changes everything. So we say we go in the records, but we really go to the threshold of the records. Cause if we went in the records, we would end up in this wacky situation, like back to the future where Michael Fox's mother's trying to kiss him and he's looking at the family. Photo <laughs> yeah. You know? yeah. Um, so, so we are actually at the threshold and we're working with record keepers and, um, um, but you can be told about contracts and you can also be, um, working with the energy in a way that allows you to I'm looking for a drink here um, that allows you to um, change your contracts you know um, you could be in a situation where you just can't fix it and somebody else is dependent upon you to do something and you can just go back to the altar and ask for a transfer and get oh it <laughs> That sounds so, I mean, that sounds like, you know, military. <laughs> you're, at, you're at the bus station and you're like, you know what? I don't want to go there. I want to go here. Can I change my ticket? <laughs> you know, yeah. like, like it's, I mean, you know, that's, that's amazing. And it's so cool though, that it simplifies it um, in a way that makes it more understandable and tangible for people to think of these kinds of things that are um, normally beyond comprehension. Yeah. Or, and another thing that can happen in the records is that you can actually shift dramatically who you are because you'll get information in the records and there was a a a, a, a records reading that i had with a client in taiwan 
And this woman was um, the secretary to the head of a very large corporation and um, worked for this man for, I don't know, eight years. And then because marriages are arranged, the um, mother of this very uh, prestigious man said, you need to marry her, the secretary, because she's loyal. She knows who you are. She loves you. She wasn't in love with him, but you know, she was loyal to him, loving. And so they got married, but she still had her, her persona of a working girl. And the record keepers ex tried to get her to adapt to her new role in this uh, new environment. And she couldn't get her arms around. She couldn't comprehend it. You know, and, and it, it's kind of like when somebody finally makes it big and they have pinched themselves. This is, is this real? This is really happening? And it yeah. was a little bit like that. And then all of a sudden she shifted and the whole room moved rocked and swayed and I saw it and so did my translator. Now I, I set up a, a, a connection between me and my translator so that the translator is getting the download of information at the same time as me and can translate in real time and it's also more likely that they'll get the translation accurately rather than trying to hear my words and translate. Now in 3D they're hearing my words and translating but you know, at another level, they're getting the information, which is why she could see what I saw. Because normally she wouldn't have seen that. And that yeah. was literally a dimensional shift where this woman literally jumped tracks, jumped timelines. And that's another thing that has come of the work in the records is I've learned so much about the workings of, of life and the workings of how things work. Um, so much so that a lot of times I'll go back and listen to some clients reading and and I'll often say to a client, oh, wait, um, I'm not recording this, but I need to record it because I want to know this stuff. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. So um, it's very, it's very profound. It's always very, very profound. And the, the more evolved the client is, the more evolved the reading is. And okay. that's really sensational. And, and I will also tell you, sometimes I can hear their connection. So like you can hear a lawnmower, let's say. Um, I can literally hear their connection if they've got a really big connection. Yeah. It's like audible to me. And, um, and you do these over the phone, I assume, as well do, as in person. I do over the phone. I do FaceTime. I do Skype, all of it. Yeah. Okay. And I also teach people how to go on the records. And that's primarily why I keep getting invited everywhere because um, teaching is my first love. Yeah. Um, it's nice to be able to identify that, but I love working with people. And so I teach online courses. Um, and I also teach um, in person in a few cities here and there. I um, do a lot of trade shows. So I'm at Conscious Life Expo and uh, New Life Expo and some of those events, you know, that are around. Yeah, yeah that's, that's going to be awesome because I'm going to get, I'll, I'll be at the Conscious Life Expo too. So I'll get to meet with you. Yeah. Excellent. Yeah. So that's, I was just going to ask, do you get out to LA very often with these, um, well, with the courses that you do? You know, it, it's interesting. I actually, this is very interesting and it's kind of plays into some other kind of knowledge and that is, um, um, I've had two homes for like the last 10 years and first it was Seattle and then it was, um, San Diego. And when I was in San Diego, I was in San Diego for three years. I could never get any connection. I met a number of interesting people. I made a number of interesting friends, but even those people moved away. Like I made one really good friend in um, San Diego, but then she moved back to Seattle. So hmm. I didn't know her when she was in Seattle, but I met her in San Diego. And uh, what I know what I believe rather I should say is that when you're in a city that you don't have that kind of connection with, no matter how hard you try, you know, you don't get any action. Yeah. I met people, I met people in the, you know, getting my nails done that wanted to come to my meditation class. It was free and they'd come a few times and then they wouldn't come anymore. And then I, I started a meetup group, you know, free meditation group. And I figured, you know, with my name and my reputation and my books that are out there that, 
you know, I'd, I'd draw. Yeah. I'd, I'd get, I got 40, 50 people, then it jumped to 150 people, and none would show up. Not a one. Wow. So, so, you know, the universe didn't want me to get settled in San Diego or to yeah. get down roots, so to speak. But New York has been that place for you mm -hmm. where you found all that. Okay. Mm -hmm. And in addition to that, then I've been, you know, invited all, like I said, all over the world. I was the first person to take the Merkaba meditation to Bulgaria and Scotland. And um, I've taught it in the UK. Um, I've taught it in Japan. Um, I'm really big in, in China right now. Um, I also spent a number of years teaching in Taiwan. Wow. So, um, that's, yeah, that's it's amazing. Very, very interesting. Um, I like to say I go where I'm towed. <laughs> so I, I want to, um, before we have to go, I want you to be able to talk a little bit about um, the 5D experience. Um, and the, the one thing I watched a, an interview of yours and the way that I understood it was when you talked about how you... Um, you maybe come in the house, you're feeling really good, you're, you know, a high vibration, you set your sunglasses down, then you get caught up in the chaos of paying bills or, you know, whatever, the mundane stuff, and then you go to pick up your glasses and they're not there. Because when you came in, you were almost in a, a different vibratory exactly. dimension. Yeah, you're in 5D, but then when you go back down to three, then they're not there. But then if you bring yourself back, then they're there again. So what's kind of the the easiest um most well, first of all, way i, I suppose that the dimensions are nested like russian dolls so first you know get wrap your brain around that and then begin to understand that like a radio station higher um stations are not visible to the lower ones right. um and when you're vibrating at a high level you can look down but when you're at a low one you can't look up you can't see anything above you so five has more access than three. That would be the way to look at it. And it is a vibrational data set. So you're not really moving. You know, there was a movie with Kevin Costner and, and about a radio, you know, where they were able to do some kind of time travel thing. I'll have to look it up. Oh, uh, that, was with, uh, that was with Dennis Quaid. Oh, Dennis Quaid. Okay. Yes. Great movie. It's called Frequency. Frequency. Okay. Well, it's like yeah. that. And so yeah. you're able to... Um, you're able to uh, um, access this zone of love and joy. And as you've described it accurately, you know, you, you are in a place of contentment and joy and peace, and you're radiating unconditional love. Even if you're not aware that you are, you are. Um, now, what I'd like to, I mean, I wrote a whole book on it, on why it's important and how to identify when you've been there. And one of the most important things is a lot of people have tried to tell us that when we have this dimensional shift or when we all have the ascension experience, that that's it. It's like a, you know, a big bang or something. And I have always been shown by guidance that it's been a, going to be a gradual thing. Yeah. And um, when I was a young mother, and one of my sons, who was always in trouble, um, did something really mature. And now I'm on the phone with my mother, you know, saying, oh, finally, you know, we have some maturity here, blah, blah, blah. And she said, well, honey, just remember, kids don't grow up in a straight line. And when she said that, I thought, what could she possibly mean? <laughs> so I said, her, what does that mean? And she said, well... After they do something mature, they usually follow it with something really stupid. <laughs> yeah. And we, and we do that as that, adults too. <laughs> that's us. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. And so the, the, the path to the ascended master me is maturity, do something stupid. Maturity, do something stupid. Maturity, yeah. do something stupid. And little by little, we're going up, but we're right. still falling back into the 3D. Now, what's interesting is, I believe we're already 5D on the planet. I believe everybody's 5D, all the energy is 5D, and what we're doing is we're pulling our 3D patterns, our 3D belief systems, our 3D habits back in. 
And then we get the 3D experience because we can, we can dip into that well, but we don't have to. And the benefit of knowing that is that, oh, I can be 5D all the time. That's awesome. I can have wonderful experiences. That's freaking awesome. And it changes everything because now all you have to do is look on the bright side of everything and yeah. manifest that way and achieve what you want that way. You know, um, um, a person could be a coffee snob and say, I had the best cup of coffee over here. Or they can say, that last place I was at was horrible. I'm never going back there. Yeah. yeah. You know? I'd rather focus on all the good because that keeps me 5D. Yeah. And it doesn't mean I'm being Pollyanna. It means I'm purposefully focusing on non-judgment. I'm yes. purposely being proactive with my words and my language. It means I'm purposefully choosing to reside in a vibration that makes room for all experiences. That also means that I forgive my debts and debtors and that I don't hold grudges and I don't hold judgment on what people did to me. So all those stories about he done me wrong have to go. They just yeah. have to go. And that's really difficult. In fact, even the have to word has to go. You know, because the minute we say I have to anything, we're giving our power away to some other source. But when we say I'm, you know, I like to pick up my kids on time because they love it when they're not the last one, you know, leaving. Or I'm having dinner with my husband and I need to leave now. Or I, I really want to work on this report tonight because I promised my boss I'd have it ready in the morning. Those are proactive, powerful choice here. Now, why is that important? Because when we keep the power here, we are then able to use the 5D power that has already been granted to us and is already here waiting for us to command it. So our commanding it makes it so. And the more we empower ourselves with our powerful statements of ownership, whether it's you know the stuff we like or the stuff we don't like, it changes everything. So I, I have a whole list in the book of words that you want to abandon, you know, and good and bad, right and wrong are right mm -hmm. up there. We have to, you know, let all those words go. And instead say, that pleases me. That doesn't work for me. Yeah. That doesn't say anything about that that dinner was lousy. It just says, yeah. oh, that didn't work for me. Yeah, yeah. I'm sure avocados are fabulous. So many people love them. I can't stand them doesn't mean I judge anybody else for eating them. It's just, it, does, it doesn't work yeah, for me. Yeah, it doesn't work for you. Right. Yeah. You make it, and you make it something. And I put, um, I even talked about in the first page or two of my book that I said, you know, I had a, I didn't have a rough childhood or anything like that. Um, I, but I always knew, um, I mean, everything's objective, right? Some people that had maybe a better one would look at mine and go, yeah, you had it kind of rough, you know, but then I know, you know, it wasn't so bad to me. I always knew that it felt better to feel good than it did to feel bad. And so I would do whatever. <laughs> I mean, that's so simple and, and Pollyanna, but that for me, that was the easiest way to look at it. And I, so if I felt bad, then I would do whatever I had to do to change the way that that felt. Um, all the way to the simple things like I feel, if I don't feel like doing the dishes, I do them anyway, because not doing them and having them sitting there later feels worse than the actual task of doing it in the moment that, that I decide to do them. You know, um, the pain, That's pleasure kind of thing. thing mm -hmm. Yeah, which That's one feels worse thing. and, yeah, yeah. yeah. And so yeah. I, I feel like we need the, well, and we get the contrast the whole time growing up, you know, the of, of what doesn't feel good. And so you make, decisions based on on that and go that relationship was unhealthy these are the things that made it unhealthy i don't want that again i'm going to make better choices moving forward like you were talking about kind of but you're going up you still have or, the dips or, but it's like saying i'm going to make better choices i'm going to make different choices yeah oh yes better is judgment isn't it <laughs> yeah yeah exactly I'm make new decisions so i'm going to attract to me and you know that was a good match but i can do better uh, it, then that better is also judgmental, but in a way, if you say, you know, I made some good choices and it was a good match, but I'd like to try something new that is even more pleasing, probably is the only yeah. way. You know, it, it, well, it, it's a, tricky, but... Pay respects to, um, I mean, I've, I've had unhealthy marriages, more than one, and, but 
but I totally pay homage to that because I learned so much about who I am or who I was then that I attracted that, that it made it easier for me to transition into something different mm -hmm. and new. Um, so, so yeah, to have respect for all the different experiences that you have, because that's what's helping to propel you um, forward. So um, please tell everybody about how they can get in touch with you and, and what, is it just the Akashic Record readings that you do? The, I mean, the one-on-one the -on -one readings? Well, I know you do all the workshops, but what other yeah. kind of readings do you do for people? Well, on -on -one? Um, I, I do one-on-one -on -one readings. Um, and, um, I'm very heavily booked. So, you know, people are, um, probably going to be booking into the new year to get a spot with me. Um, I also offer online coursework to learn how to open your own records and learn how to open the records for others. I also have a huge amount of material that people can, uh, explore and investigate. I've written five books and they have been translated in to seven languages um, and the list keeps growing. Um, the best-selling book so far is Waking Up in 5D and uh, Opening Your Akashic Records is right behind it and then Beyond the Flower of Life is right behind that. So they're all selling well. And then I have probably 20, 15 or 20 guided meditations that I um, wrote the music for and scored and wrote the text for and recorded. And this is one of my big loves also. I really love doing that. And um, <clears throat> the guided meditations are very wonderful because there's some that are you know, 20 minutes long and there's a lot that are 30 minutes long and there's a few that are 10 minutes long. And it just depends upon what the need is or what they're supposed to do. In my blog post, I highly recommend people sign up for my blog because every month I come out with a new freebie. And so the benefit of, of you know, creating uh, uh, all these wonderful CDs for people and being part of that blog is that you get that for free. And then I also have a year-long program called the Ascension Institute. And every, every year I um, invite people to apply and then, you know, a few people are selected. And then I also have a year-long training program that is automatic where you sign up for trainings and classes and things like that. So there's a lot of information that I put out there for people. And then I write for a lot of magazines. I write for the Sedona Journal and a couple of other magazines. So oh. there's a lot of material out there for people to yeah. um, digest and explore. Mm -hmm. And I am continually being inspired by the information that comes through in the records and the information that just comes through in channeled messages. And so um, I'm still learning. And um, I like to think that that's probably one of the reasons why I'm a good teacher because I'm still learning. I'm not afraid. Yes, you're open. To yeah. Step into that. Yeah. And so I imagine the bulk of that information for people is on your website. Yes. Yes. So you can okay. sign up for my blog on my website and every month get a free download of a free meditation of some sort. And then, um, you know, all the other programs you have to sign up for and pay for, but the blog is free. Okay, and, tell and, one more thing, I have a permanent guided meditation called Divine Government Meditation. And the reason it's permanent is because it's always there, it's always free. Um, and I like to remind people that when you get pulled into that political argument, you're getting pulled into 3D drama and your energy is being used against you. Yes. And instead of, you know, worried about whatever they're doing, better that you use your energy to pray for them so that they can make better decisions. Yeah. So tell everybody the, um, the web address to oh, your website. It's maureenstgermain.com. So it's M-A-U-R-E-E-N-S-T-G-E-R-M-A-I-N.com. Okay. And everybody, yes, please go. And I've been on the website and it's full of wonderful information for you. Um, her books about getting the readings done, if that's what you'd like to do. Um, thank you so much for joining me, Maureen. Again, have a Merry Christmas and Merry Christmas to everybody out there. And uh, yeah, turn it back on. <laughs> and we will see you next time on Outside the Box here on Expansion Network. Thank you so much.